Let's show life with Theatre of Science! <clears throat> First, the news. That was a bit, a bit. I hope you enjoyed it. <clears throat> this week, 61 years ago, Luna 2 landed on the moon. The Russian rocket was the first thing that human beings had made to touch anything in space. Um, the Russians had actually put a rocket in space a bit earlier, but some people were very jealous, like America were also trying to get into space. So a lot of people said that they faked it. So the Russians had racked their brains to think, how are we going to prove to people that Luna 2, our rocket, has actually landed on the moon? And then they remembered that in Manchester, a chap called Bernard Lovell had the best tracking telescope in the world. So they sent him the coordinates of where Luna 2 was going to be, and then the whole world, world waited. And it was actually Bernard Lovell in, at Jodrell Bank Telescope in Manchester who told the whole world, yeah, no, it's absolutely right, I've tracked it, it's landed on the moon. So there you go. That's because Britain weren't in the space race. If you don't take sides, stay friends with everyone. You get the cool jobs. Uh, three years after that, and also this week, <coughs> President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, gave a very famous speech where he said, we choose to go to the moon and do other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. He was trying to prove to the American people that it was worth spending a lot of money to go into space. Uh, because it was going to be really good for humanity and really good for science and a really good way to show that America were better than Russia. And this is my favourite. 60 years ago tomorrow, a chap called Abibi Bikila became the first black person from Africa to win a gold medal at the Olympics. And because um, when the Ethiopian team arrived in Rome, the running shoes that they were given they didn't really fit him and they gave him blisters. He also became the first person to win the Olympic marathon running in bare feet. And he set a new world record. So the science on running in bare feet. In 2010, someone wrote a book called Born to Run, which is about how um, in like ancient Mexico, people had run super marathons wearing really thin shoes. And if you look at the adults in the room at the moment, they, will, they might remember that in like 2012-13, Everyone was buying these ridiculous sort of trainers that kind of looked like gloves and had like little holes for each of your toes. Loads of trainer companies made loads of money selling people these new incredibly small shoes. And loads more people than usual went to the doctors with broken toes. Uh, so science at the moment says there doesn't seem to be any benefit between wearing their feet or wearing shoes. Um, a BB Bikila, the next Olympics, became the first person ever to win two Olympic gold for marathons in a row. And he ran that race in shoes. Just like to show that he could. Um, after, very shortly after that, he was in a car accident and was paralyzed from the waist down. Um, so entered a sledging competition in Norway instead and won gold for that as well. So there you go, that's the end of the science news. I wasn't gonna play the recorder again, but I really enjoyed it. Years. Okay, we're going to do an activity experiment and then we're going to do story time. But first, new feature, dinosaur discovery of the week. I'm going to tell you how a dinosaur is discovered and you have to guess before the end of the story which dinosaur it is. Our story begins. In 1874, a teacher called Arthur Lakes was hiking in Colorado when one of his class found a nine centimetre long jagged banana shaped tooth. They sent it to a, a paleontologist who studies dinosaurs at Yale. They never heard anything about it but it was actually rediscovered 20 years ago and it turns out that that kid never found out that he would discovered the first ever tooth of our dinosaur. Then 1892 a museum owner called Edward Cope found two bits of spine which also belonged to our dinosaur. Put them back there. Um, and Cope said that it came from a very large herbivore, a Vegasaurus, 
and he named it Manospondylus gigas, which is a rubbish name, which means giant porous vertebrae. And then, in 1900, famous plant buoyant fossil hunter Barnum Brown was hunting for a triceratops skull when he discovered some more of our dinosaur's bones. He found huge armoured plates, which I will put there. Um, he also found some other bits and pieces as well. Uh, the museum realised that this dinosaur was a carnivore. Uh, they, they called it Dinomosaurus imperiosus, which means imperial powerful lizard. And they put it to one side, because they were publishing a paper in 1905, and they wanted to tell everyone about it in that paper. And then Barnum found another skeleton of our dinosaur. He wrote to the museum, There is no question, this is the find of the season! It had a huge tail. A jaw that weighed the same as a horse, it walked on its hind legs, it had teeny little arms. That's right, the American Museum of Natural History called this one a Tyrannosaurus rex, rex, which means Tyrant Lizard King. And then they published their paper in 1905. Um, and they put these two dinosaurs in it. They listed the Dinomosaurus imperiosus and the T-Rex. And then they realised very soon after that, oh, they're the same dinosaur. This is a T-Rex too. These armoured plates that they thought were part of that dinosaur, they were found with this skeleton. But where do you think they were? Yeah, turns out they were in the, the, that T-Rex's stomach. So we've got two names for the same animal. What do we do? Dinosaur naming rules say you have to use the name that's published first, but both these dinosaurs were published in the same paper, so they had to go by the one that was mentioned first, and very, very luckily for us dinosaur fans, the T-Rex was on page 262, and the Dynamo thingy was on the very next page. Whew! So the T-Rex caught its name. Uh, this is nearly the end of the story, except 20 years ago, a chap called Peter Larson went to where Edward Cope had found these two tiny little bits of spine from that herbivore, you remember, um, and looked for the rest of that skeleton, and it turns out Edward Cope, he found a T-Rex, he thought he should have kept looking. Now, dinosaur ruling names um, really said that we should always call the dinosaur by the very first one that was discovered, which means the T-Rex would have had to have its name changed to Manospondylus gigas. Um, luckily, they had just changed the rules. So, if a dinosaur had had its name for 50 years, it got to keep its name. So, luckily, just because they just changed the rule, the T-Rex gets to be the T-Rex forever. Yeah, the theme of today's convection, so it's time for us to do our activity. So come with me. Here we go. So, you've got to listen quite carefully. Now, well done if you managed to find four identical spice pots. Um, you can actually have two pairs, or maybe you've just got two. If you've just got two, then that's fine. Uh, you will need some hot water, some cold water, some food colouring, and little bits of card. The, the piece of card, you can cut it so that it just fits over the spice jar. All right, here we go. So first of all, um, if you're using four, put some hot water into two of your jars. If you're only using two jars, just put hot water in one jar. There we go. I only discovered this quite recently. This is such a cool activity. I can't believe this hasn't come up. And then put cold water into the other two jars. Ah, oh, Charlotte, you like my haircut? Thank you. I've never been so excited to have my haircut. So you've got hot water in two jars and cold water in two jars. Go. And then, if you're doing it with four jars, you want to put food colouring in the warm ones and different food colouring in the cold ones. If you've only got one food colouring, put it in the warm ones. So put some food colouring in the warm ones now. Don't put too much in. So. And then if you've got another colour, Put another colour into the cold ones. Then, this is the really tricksy bit. If you saw our um, air lesson over lockdown, you've, you know what happens if you put card over a little opening like this with a thing of water in it. Um, so put the 
one cold and hot together and another cold and hot together. Here we are. If, you're, if you've only got two jars, then do this bit with me. We're going to put this hot water on top of this cold water. <laughs> so put a little square of cardboard on top of your spice jar. Turn it upside down, and for reasons which, if you want to know, you'll have to watch my air lesson, which is on my YouTube channel. When you let go, it should stay. Don't, don't let go for that long. Just pop it on top. Definitely get someone to help you if there's someone else in the room. I'm going solo, so I'm going to have to do this alone. What you want to end up with is the jars bounce on top of each other and a little bit of cardboard in the middle. Um, I should have I told you to put it on a baking tray. I'm, I'm hoping that you've realised this, that whenever water is involved with digital science, get your baking tray or washing up tub out. All right, and then I'm going to very carefully and gently pull this card away. Some of, some of it might spill, but as long as you've got quite a bit in there, you should be all right. Okay, ready? There we go. Look at that. Let's come down and see. There we go. That's one. And then we'll do the same with the other one. So if you've only got two jars, just leave yours like that. If you've got two more jars, do the same, but this time put the blue on top. I know when the comments stop that, <laughs> that people are busy concentrating. I'm going to do the same again. What could possibly go wrong? Come see this, come see this. Alright, so can you see this one isn't mixed at all? And this one has got this gorgeous purple colour. See that one? What has happened there? If you've only done one and you have observed that they haven't mixed, then you can turn it over and see what happens. Isn't that brilliant? The one that I saw it online said to do it with like really narrow necked bottles, um, but I just thought that was a recipe for disaster and spice jars, I think worked really well. So what is actually happening there? Well, what you are looking at is something called convection, which is the most boring name for the most important, exciting, scientific thing that happens on our planet. So what convection is, Again, if you watched um, the lockdown hot air balloons lesson or the storm lesson, you know that when things get warm, like um, gases or liquids get warm, then the particles that they're made of get a lot more energy and move around more and so spread out. And if the particles in something spread out, we say it's got less dense. So say that is a glass of cold water. Well, so let's say that if that's a, a box of cold air, then this would be the box of warm air. So the box of cold air, there are, there are more particles per this amount of space. So this we would say is denser than this. And things that are less dense rise and things that are more dense sink. So with this one, we put the less dense thing on the top and the more dense thing on the bottom. So everything's kind of where it wants to be, like things that are less dense rise. So there's no reason for them to mix together. Whereas with this one, we put the less dense thing on the bottom, so that had more energy, so it spread out and moved upwards. And then there was a gap at the bottom, so the cold water sank down to fill that space, um, which mixed the colours together. And that mixing, where warm things rise through cold things and cold things sink, that is called convection. Um, and convection controls, like, everything important that you can think of in the world. So I'll give you a few examples and I'll start with very small and then I'll end in very big. So a very small example is if you boil a egg in a pan then you'll see the water starts like doing this and bubbling and bubbling and um, that needs convection because you're heating the bottom of the pan and the hot water is rising up and then when it gets to the top it's cooling down so it's falling and then it's heating up again so it's rising up and then it's cooling down so it's falling and convection cooks the egg. If it went for convection you'd just end up with like a very hot egg at the bottom and a non-cooked egg at the top. Um, it's how 
If you've ever seen a fridge with a little freezer compartment in it, you'll have noticed the freezer is at the top because the freezer makes the air cold, so the cold air sinks. The warm air goes up and then the warm air gets cold, so it sinks. And then the air at the top gets cold and yeah, that's a convection current. Um, ovens are the opposite. If you've ever forgotten about your biscuits and taken them out of the oven and thought, oh, phew, they're all right, and then you've bitten it and been like, ah, oh, the bottom's all black and horrible, that's because in an oven, it's the bottom that gets heated and the warm air rises up and it's just the warm air like brushing against the food that cooks the food and then at the top the air cools down so it falls and gets hot again so it rises up and then cold air takes its place and like this so that's why the bottom of your stuff sometimes burns even when the top's okay because it's the first bit that encounters that warm air um the other thing that uses convection is the atmosphere so again, in our storms lesson, we learned the sun heats the earth, the earth heats the air just above it, and then that warm air rises and cold air comes in to take its place, and then that air rises and cold air takes, comes in to take its place. And all over the planet, there are these little, what we call cells of convection, like this. So there's one there, there's one there, there's one up there. Um, and that's, that's how clouds stay in the sky. That's why clouds are there, because they're sort of, there's this constant upthrust coming from the atmosphere. And probably the coolest one, uh, the oceans also have absolutely gorgeous convection currents in them. You can look at maps online, there's just patterns all over the earth where the water sort of moves in the same way all the time um, from the colder regions of the poles to the equator and then back round again, like this. So you've got your ice at the poles, cold water sinks down and sits on top of really, really cold water at the bottom and goes to the equator and then that gets warmed up because the equator is very hot and the warm water comes by this way and then cold water comes by this way and then that creates more space again. So, And this, this cycle on the planet, it takes 800 years for water to complete this cycle. Isn't that just incredible? So that's... Um, what convection is, is fluids like airs or uh, gases or liquids carrying uh, energy and that's how heat gets carried across the oceans and nutrients as well, so incredibly important. Um, and I've missed one out because it's the subject of story time. Um, but the next really big example of convection is the sun. So stars have nuclear reactions going off inside them and they fuel convection currents. If you've ever seen a photo of the sun and you feel like seeing prominences like loops coming off the sun, that's what convection is. Right, story time. Let's do it. Look down. Go on, you can. Look down right now. I'm not going to do anything on the screen until you look down. Just look right down, okay? The centre of the earth is 3,963 miles that way. So far, Humans have dug seven miles down. It gets incredibly difficult to dig any further than that. At eight miles down, the pressure is so great, it feels like 131 elephants are standing on your head. So our knowledge of the Earth comes from studying the vibrations, the seismic waves given off by earthquakes. So scientists have put 150 seismic stations across the planet to detect seismic waves and work out what is happening underneath our feet right now. Ed Garnero learned how to read these waves at university. His professor would point excitedly to seismograms and shout, look at this one. And uh, Ed says he was actually giddy. I had no idea what he was talking about, but I thought, well, if he's this giddy, it must be something really cool. And eventually Ed says he learned what the signals meant and that they are windows into the inner earth. Now, if you look up what's inside the earth, you will see a picture that looks like Earth has an inner core 
of solid iron. It's as hot as the surface of the sun, but it can't melt because it's been too squashed by the rest of the earth. And then the outer core is um, liquid iron. And then there's the mantle, made of thick liquid rock. Uh, so how it works is incredibly hot rock rises up through the earth and then cooler rock falls to take its place and then that rock gets hot so that rises up and then the hot rock by this point has cooled so that falls down and then that gets hot and then the other one cools and you know what I mean now. So it's an enormous, incredibly slow convection current happening beneath our feet right now. And then above is the Earth's crust, which luckily for us is mostly not made of burning liquid. Although, the currents inside the Earth have broken the crust in places and they slowly slide around on top of the planet in plates um, and hot rock seeps up through the gaps and this is what we call a volcano. So this is what we've learned in past volcano and earthquake lessons and most people on the internet will tell you that is the full story of what is happening inside the Earth. But if you look really closely, you will find that the truth is much stranger. Now a grown-up geologist leading a team, Ed Garnero has looked very closely indeed. Those seismic stations have been showing that inside the Earth, in two places, on pretty much opposite sides of the planet, seismic waves are doing something extremely weird. They split. So here's seismic waves. Maybe they've come from an earthquake on the other side of the Earth. They travel through the Earth and then they split. One wave goes straight ahead and slows down. And the other wave goes off in a different direction at normal speed. They're tracing out blobs. That is genuinely what the scientists are calling them. Big blobs. Blobs the size of Australia. 100 times higher than Mount Everest underneath our feet. The seismic waves, Garneo says, suggest that the blobs are made of a different material to the rest of the mantle. They're lying on the bottom of the mantle, so we know they must be denser, and directly above the blobs are where the volcanoes are. Young ones and very old ones. What is going on? New research, Sir Mariah Sakmistrenko, a seismologist at the University of Oxford, has also found the blobs are sending hot rocks right up to the surface and causing volcanoes. And please do not underestimate how big these things are. Um, if the blobs were sitting on the surface of the earth, then the ISS would have to go around them. That's how high they are. And in fact, three months ago, um, scientists studied the blobs using a computer algorithm designed to look at far off galaxies. Uh, and they discovered incredible things. So usually seismologists see only study quite small amounts of data, whereas these scientists fed 7,000 seismograms into this special computer algorithm um, that spanned 30 years of activity. And yeah, they discovered a new blob and that one of these blobs is much, much bigger than they first thought. They think that the blobs might be ancient rock material that sank into planet Earth even before it had a moon. So they might contain really primitive material. Uh, geophysicist Barbara Monerowitz, she's the daughter of a famous Polish writer, she says that for geology, this is a revelation. Um, for now, the blobs remain a mystery, but we know they're down there right now. So do you feel free to, to just look down again? Just think about that. Convection, boring name. It's, it's fueling everything that we do. Um, folks, that is the end of my science show live. Thank you so much for joining me.